How you doing? Hey. Um, uh, Sochi just emailed me having trouble with the link too, so I'm gonna get back to her real quick. Okay. Might be just send her the password in the um Hi, Sochi. Hey, folks. I just got on using a, I like went to re-register and it let me on this way. I just want to make sure I'm in the right place so there's not like a separate, I'm cool here. Okay, great. <laughs>
All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, I'm gonna give it a, just a couple more minutes. We have about 300 people registered and I see about 40 or so participants. So um, just give it maybe two minutes, 302, and we will um, get going. Thanks for your patience and thanks for joining. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today for this conversation, Divest to Save Black Lives, Invest to Heal Communities, centering impacted voices to reimagine a new vision of justice. My name is Dewey Pham, and I'm a policy analyst here at CLASP. We have an incredible panel of speakers, but before we get started, I wanted to go over a few logistics and offer some framing for the conversation. So please keep yourself on mute and use a chat function to ask questions. I see you all already engaging and introducing yourselves. Please keep that up. Um, we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. So please send in your questions if you have them and as you have them. Um, as you can see too, the discussion is being recorded and live streamed on our Facebook page. We'll share the recording after the event and please do engage on social media with the hashtag invest to heal, all one word. So over the past, past several months, the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, Rashard Brooks, and countless others have once again elevated the daily violence Black people face to the national forefront. And just a few days ago, we witnessed law enforcement align themselves with white supremacists to murder protesters demanding justice for Jacob Blake. At the same time millions are protesting the state-sanctioned violence, Black people are disproportionately infected and killed by the COVID-19 virus due to a confluence of structural factors, including the absence of health infrastructure, a lack of culturally responsive healthcare, and centuries of exposure to environmental toxins and stress. These dual pandemics have forced us to come to a reckoning. As a nation, we have underinvested in the health and well-being of Black communities, while we've overinvested in systems that enact violence on Black lives. At CLASP, we've also been confronting our own role in this movement. While we've long been agents for incremental change, we recognize the need for a bolder, deeper approach. Angela Davis often talks about the need for radical change with the meaning of the word radical being root. Radical change requires us to develop solutions that dismantle the root of oppressive structures and have, that have persisted and evolved for over 400 years. We're committed to advancing bold and radical policy change what we are calling healing-centered liberation policy. Healing-centered liberation policy thinks beyond what is and demands what should be. It requires new decision-making structures 
acknowledges failed and abandoned policies, and recognizes both historical harms and ongoing discrimination. It advances a radical imaginative approach to reparations that isn't static and transactional, considering a host of systemic policies that have economically persecuted and disenfranchised Black Americans. Healing-centered liberation policy requires us to follow the lead of activists and communities who've been doing the work of organizing and building community-led infrastructure to dismantle the police state and create thriving Black and Brown communities. This event is a part of a series of engagements under this healing-centered framework. We're committed to advancing a new vision of community investment that overturns centuries of white supremacy. We've seen communities come together to make radical demands to divest and defund systems of mass incarceration and law enforcement led by organizations like the Movement for Black Lives and Black Lives Matter. At the same time, they are also demanding large scale investments in historically oppressed communities. This work is not new. Today, we are so lucky to be joined with leaders who have been at the forefront for demanding greater investments for many years. Leaders who have actually disrupted these systems of oppression and worked to turn them into opportunities for healing. To introduce our panel and joining me in moderating this discussion is our fearless leader and guiding light, Keisha Bird, Director of Youth Policy and Justice at CLASP. This healing centered liberation policy framework is really her vision and we are so honored to be a part of it. Keisha. Thank you, Dewey. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I think, um, you know, uh, woke up today with a very heavy heart and um, wanted what I was, you know, put on, on social media that I wanted to call out black today. And I know all many of us are feeling that way um, as um, black people, but also as allies. Um, but I knew we were gonna have this important conversation and um, want to share some of the work that has been happening in communities for decades. And also um, to do a little dreaming and strategizing together across sectors, because what, what we're facing requires all of us to move into this um, healing center frame. Um, so before we uh, begin, I wanna give uh, one update that unfortunately Deanna Hoskins is unable to join us today. Um, she did fall ill and so our um, thoughts and uh, prayers are with her right now. Um, and then I wanted just us to kind of center ourselves and begin with a moment of silence for the some of the victims that do we talked about and the countless names in communities across this country that are um, victims of state sanctioned violence but also um, those who have been impacted directly and indirectly families and communities by our mass incarceration policies and our um, war on drugs our failed war on drugs that has really devastated um, black and brown communities so a moment of silence Okay, all right, thank y'all. So um, we are also still joined with two um, local leaders, um, national leaders as well, um, who've been in this uh, movement and fight for justice. So we have Terry Green, who is the founder and executive director of Think Make Live Youth, which, which does work in uh, Columbus and Ohio and across the nation. And Sochi Bavera, who is the director of the Racial Justice Action Center, who does work in Atlanta and Georgia and also across the nation. So their full bios will be dropped in the chat so you can read all about their work, but they're gonna get an opportunity to share about themselves and their work um, right now. So I'll start with you, Terry. Um, if you can just briefly just introduce yourself, tell us the work that you've been doing to shift investment away from mass incarceration and law enforcement um, and those who've been most impacted into investments that are most um, impacted by um, the criminal justice or criminal legal system, as we have been saying as well. Thank you, Keisha. I truly appreciate you for uh, the introduction. Uh, and also thank you, D uh, Dewey, for your leadership uh, with class. Uh, I know you guys are doing some great work uh, and I, I'm, I'm glad for you guys to be able to invite me on this platform. For, uh, for everybody, my introduction, my name is uh, Terry Green. 
I am the founder and executive director of Think Make Live Youth Nonprofit, which is a, a local nonprofit uh, based out in Columbus, Ohio, that was founded in 2017 uh, to support young people, opportunity youth, uh, foster care youth and justice involved youth by connecting them to uh, resources so they can thrive out of their situations. Um, and for me, myself, I was a homeless youth. Uh, at the age of 15 years old, I watched my mother get incarcerated and I was uh, disconnected from my father, uh, dealing with some challenging circumstances in terms of uh, where I was going to eat, sleep and survive. I ended up being affected by the criminal justice system. And so now I'm standing on the forefront as a leader, as an executive director, uh, supporting other young people who uh, experience uh, similar situations. Uh, and my journey started off as a, a motivational speaker and a youth mentor. Uh, I was a graduate of a uh, youth build and I see some of my youth build uh, fellow people on here, uh, Dorothy Stonish, Dorothy for being on here, who's the founder of youth build and also David Abramovich who also worked for youth build. Uh, shout out to them too for uh, being on this platform. But I wanna say that uh, in terms of the question, what, what am I doing in terms of uh, supporting young people um, in, during this challenging time is, you know, our organization, we you know, primarily, like I said, work with those foster care youth, um, those justice involved youth. So figuring out ways that, you know, as an organization that was around, um, you know, having large events, bringing young people together um, during youth summits and gatherings and such of that nature, we can't do that anymore. So now we shift to the focus of how do you support young people during this time. And a lot of young people uh, need resources, um, need resources in terms of um, employment resources. And so we are uh, we are actually in the process of um, uh, finishing off our um, pilot program that was actually a program that was funded by the Parks and Recs uh, here in the city of Columbus to actually support those young people. So being able to be on the forefront to actually give them employment opportunities um, so that they can be able to um, grow out of these situations is, is what we're doing uh, in terms of working with uh, opportunity youth, justice involved youth and foster care youth in, in Columbus, Ohio. Thank you. And Sochi, tell us a little bit about um, yourself and the work that you've been doing to shift investments away from mass incarceration, law enforcement, and two communities that have been most impacted by this um, criminal legal system. Definitely. Thank you so much. And thanks, Keisha and Dewey. Um, I agree. I'm really honored to be on this panel and to see all the introductions. There's just people from all over um, doing amazing work. So um, I'm really glad to be here. I'm Sochil Brevera, Director of the Racial Justice Action Center. Um, and our history, kind of our work, that's what we've been about for the last eight years. We're based here in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, our work has been committed to um, bringing together folks from various impacted communities. So oftentimes when we say directly impacted, we think of a singular monolithic community. And we also know that that's not, that's not true. We are many of us impacted in different ways by criminalization and our criminal legal system. So uh, we were really committed to the um, experiment of how do we bring um, our communities together uh, to fight against criminalization, to divest from a punitive carceral system and then invest in the kind of systems and supports that keep our communities safe and well. Um, and so we've had grassroots projects. Um, our Solutions Not Punishment Collaborative is a black trans and queer led collaborative um, that spun off into its own organization this year um, along with Women on the Rise, which is an organization led by formerly incarcerated women. Um, and both of these organizations, former projects, now organizations, um, both work locally um, and regionally um, from the lens of, you know, really centering impacted people and, and like I said, working across community, but to figure out how it is that we can actually move resources um, and how it is that we can shift culture as well in our communities um, and in the larger society so that we stop thinking, we stop equating safety and wellness with police, jails, and courts um, and start equating those things with the powerful um, you know, supports and services that we know in our communities actually keep us safe and well. Thanks, Sochi and Terry. Um, so, you know, you, you touched on this, both of you, a little bit, but, um, you know, you both are engaged in building power among those who are directly impacted. Um, so how have you centered those directly impacted in, to create this new vision of community investment? And also, how have your own experiences shaped this vision?
Terry, you want to get started first? Okay. Um, so for me, um, you know, like I said, I've been uh, directly affected by the criminal justice system. Um, at the age of 15, my story, I was, uh, my mom got incarcerated, um, disconnected from my father. I watched my best friend lose his life to gun violence at the age of 20. He was 20. I was 19. I was sentenced to serve uh, four years in prison uh, for drug possession and drug trafficking. I uh, had F4s, F5s, um, uh, drug charges, low-level felonies, uh, marijuana, low-level cocaine. Um, and I remember the judge saying that I was going to be a statistics of society, uh, saying that I was going to be, you know, back inside of the justice system and, and that, you know, people that have low level drug offenses are the ones who recidivate the most and that, you know, there was going to be, you know, odds of me, you know, breaking those statistics. And, you know, I remember, you know, going inside of the justice system and uh, being a dropout, um, you know, without a GED, but within 90 days of my incarceration, I got my GED. Within 180 days of my incarceration, um, I was working on my small business management degree, enrolled in Hawking College, um, and, and I walked inside of prison as with the judge labeled as a statistics of society, and I walked out of prison breaking statistical barriers, um, not only for myself, but for others. And just recently, I had the opportunity to um, apply for my record expungement uh, and it was truly a, a, a challenging process for me. Um, so I, I was uh, actually um, it was approved, well, not really approved. Um, I was up for my expungement um, in 2019. And the challenge is that I had uh, some fees that needed to be waived, um, some old core fees. And so I uh, filled out a motion. Um, to get those fees waived and they end up sending the information to an address that I had in the system 10 years ago and not the address that I sent on the motion. And so I went back to the court and asked them about the paperwork. They couldn't find the paperwork or whatever the case may be. And so I asked, can I speak to the judge? I said, can I speak to the judge right now today? And he was like, how could you do that? And they sent me to this one floor and I talked to, you know, some gatekeeper or prosecutor, whoever it was. And I was like, I need to talk to the judge. I need to ask them to get these fees waived because I need to get my record ex expunged and, you know, I'm eligible for, for my record expungement. And so that day, you know, the judge, right after his lunch, I came, uh, I went up there um, and went to the courtroom and, and, and sat in front of the judge. And, you know, he gave me a couple, you know, backlash of talking about, you know, why do you want to get your record expunged and such of this nature back and forth. And, you know, why did you receive the paperwork? And I'm telling him it was 10 years, uh, you know, this address that you sent that was, you know, from 10 years ago and such of that nature. And so um, then he said, okay, you know what I'm gonna do? He said, I'm going to um, weigh the fees right now today. Um, and I said, all right. And then what he did is he weighed the fees. I went downstairs and I applied for my um, record expungement. Um, and within the first week of me applying, the prosecutor, Ryan O'Brien, um, here in Columbus, Ohio, he uh, it did an objection um, opposed to uh, my expungement without even knowing who I was. And I, I, in the process, I was uh, reaching out to a lot of the people who I knew in the community to support me, from people from Ohio State to people from Washington, D.C., from people to Rhode Island, from just all the people from the work that I've done throughout, the, throughout my community. And um, what I did is I worked with the Ohio Justice and Policy Center based out in Cincinnati and worked with an attorney to uh, put together a motion. Uh, and the motion that we put together, it, it was so powerful that the prosecutor actually withdrew his objection. He withdrew his objection and they had a court date set out for August the 19th. I was supposed to go to a court hearing for August 19th. And just recently on July the 24th, the judge actually gave me my expungement, granted me an expungement in the seal of my record uh, without a court date, without a court hearing. That's how powerful 
um, the, 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 the objection, I mean, the motion to that objection was from the letter of support from, I had letters from Franklin County Auditor. I actually had a letter from the Ohio Department of jo uh, the Justice System itself. And so to understand like my story, you know, not too many people have experienced what I've experienced or will be able to have, you know, those powerful letters of support or even have a story where you don't have to go through a court hearing and a, and a judge will be able to grant you your court court uh, be able to grant your expungement off rip. There's a lot of people that's going through a lot of different challenges. And I want to be, you know, one of those stories that, as an advocate uh, for those people. If you're not connected with me on LinkedIn, please connect with me on LinkedIn. I, I build my LinkedIn following up to 22,000 followers uh, from people all over the world that's connected with me. But I'm just saying that I want my story to say that you know, it's time for, you know, my brother, sister, cousin, your cousin, brother, sister, uncle. I know there's a hundred and what, 19, 120 people that's on here. How many people that have someone that's been affected by the justice system that, you know, are eligible for their record expungement or don't even know that they're eligible for the record expungement. You know, my story is that, you know, I, I was convicted with over nine felonies, but, you know, only charged with five felonies. So the understanding I was charged with five felonies from drug possession and drug trafficking and there's so many people out there with less than what I have on their record and they're eligible for expungement and that getting their expungement can give them opportunities they can you know gain home ownership get their you know life insurance um, get other different resources employment opportunities get enrolled in different colleges and Ivy League universities that won't allow people with backgrounds and with criminal records to uh, enroll inside of those uh, universities and so I want my story uh, as overcoming um, you know the justice system them and you know as being you know just as involved youth is with like like I said the judge labeled me as a statistic and now look at me now you know I'm a blessing you know and I, I want my story to be a blessing for other for those uh who, who who's out there to experience um the justice system and and thinking about you know now let's challenge the system is that the, you know the prosecutor didn't even know who I was and it's ironic that the same prosecutor that you know um did the objection for my my expungement I was actually in a newspaper article and I can share the link I'll share the link inside of here with you guys here in a second I was a newspaper article with uh, the prosecutor for the Columbus dispatch and we was talking about the surge violence at, uh, of youth here and how we're providing opportunities for young people so they can be able to uh, uh, be able to thrive and then ironically that's the same prosecutor that had to write the the signature on my expungement papers you know I just say it's a full turnaround right the same judge who had to do the hearing for for my expungement was a judge that sat on a panel for my think make live youth civic engagement form that same judge I got pictures of him speaking on a panel so I was like wow it's a full circle how you know a person is doing things in a community a person is making impact can actually Actually come in front with those people that are elective officials, the ones that are our servants to us, and we have to hold them accountable for that uh, in, in, in their actions. Um, so that's my story. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. That was beautiful. Um, that was beautiful. Um, so I think I'm actually going to answer the question in the so in the in the flip way. Um, it was asked because I think the first part of it was kind of why um, we have always worked from a place of knowing that people who are directly impacted should be centered in the work. And um, I'm actually going to borrow because Deanna's not on, but, but you know, one of the founders of Just Leadership USA um, used to say, um, those who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution, but often the furthest from power. And, um, and I have really found just throughout time that that is so, so true and that um, I've worked before on policies and, you know, with a city that's trying to make life better in some kind of way, but they create a policy without actually listening to or centering the people who are going to be impacted by it. And it doesn't achieve the things that they wanted to achieve, you know, and they're surprised when the, the center doesn't get used that they put so much time and effort into or, you know, the, or in fact, there's like an adverse response to a policy. Um, and that is because so much policy has been made in this country you know, uh, at people, you know, at us. It's like made, you know, here we're gonna, it, whether it's done to help or to harm, um, it is very infrequently done in real collaboration and really recognizing um, people 
um, and the level of expertise like was, was just shared. I mean, the level of expertise I, I find with the criminal legal system in particular. So I have not been um, in the system. I have been inside jail, but not inside prison. Um, and, I have not, and I did not spend a long uh, time there. Um, but some of my greatest mentors and teachers in this work have been people who are formerly incarcerated, who did between 10 and 27 years inside, um, the mothers of people who have been shot and killed by police, the mothers of children who've been caught up in the juvenile justice system um, in Louisiana, in New York, in California, in Georgia. And I always want to lift them up and say all their names, um, because I think that there is in particular a way that people who have been this system in the way that we live in this country, the criminal legal system eats families and communities. I mean, it just devastates. It takes money out of neighborhoods. It destroys fabrics and networks um, that are what allow people to live. And yet it sort of lives in the shadow with, um, with kind of the imprimatur of respectability, right? Like it's only bad people who are in prison. So it's fine to simply forget about them. People get locked away in rural places behind closed doors. They're not even counted in the census. They get disappeared and that impact, the negative impact is disappeared from so much. And yet in communities that are impacted, it's so everywhere, every day, all the time. Whether cops are rolling down your street, whether they're occupying that neighborhood, whether you worry you're gonna be arrested because you're undocumented or because you're a trans woman and assumed to be doing sex work because you're a young black man. Like the targeting of the criminal legal system is so intense. Um, but it is, it is also then to many other communities very unknown. And so to me, it is, it is especially important that we center the people who've been impacted by that system and that we look at the differences of those impacts. It is different to be an undocumented immigrant and fear law enforcement and make choices to not call, say, the police when you're being abused by your husband because you know what that could result in. And that is different than being a young black man in the streets of like Pittsburgh here, a neighborhood in Atlanta, or being a trans woman walking down the street in Midtown. There are different effects. You are targeted differently. And yet it is a system that kind of feeds off of, um, off of our most marginalized. And so in that way, the, the making sure that voices are centered, that solutions are centered, and it's not just voices, it's not just people getting to testify when the bill comes before the floor. It's actually who's designing the legislation. You know, it's like who gets to write the legal brief? Who gets to, um, you know, actually put the proposals in place for our centers of wellness and equity and freedom that we're building to replace jails and prisons? Um, that's where, that's at the level in which full engagement and leadership needs to be. All right. Well, we are preaching today, this afternoon. Y'all already have lifted up my spirits. Um, I shared when we first started how I was feeling this morning, um, and in particular over the last several months, but really how I was feeling this morning. Um, but we've seen um, uh, somewhat of a shift in public perception, right, around divesting um, from uh, law enforcement, defunding law enforcement and mass incarceration um, following the uprisings um, and the murder, um, in response to the murder of George Floyd. So I know y'all have been at the forefront personally and doing this work and um, doing radical transformation work in your communities and with um, other folks who've been impacted by the um, justice system. So how are you feeling in this moment? Um, and what are some of the opportunities do you think um, could come out of this darkness as a result of COVID and the pandemic, as a result of the racial justice uprising. So how are you feeling and um, what kind of lights can you know, arise from this darkness that we're all experiencing? I don't know, Terry or Sochi, whoever wants to go first. You can go first. Huh? Yeah, go ahead. Go for it. <laughs> I was pointing. I said, "Yeah, go ahead. You go." <laughs> well, I mean, for me, I, well, I, I'm definitely all about defunding the police. Um, especially, I'm all I'm all about you know advocating when it comes to young people, right? And so, thinking about 
you know, in, in a school to prison pipeline and being strategic around um, even the model that, you know, my good friend, social justice activist warrior, uh, Amber Evans used to say, uh, counselors, not cuffs, right? Uh, and, and how can we remove some of that funding that those millions of dollars that are going into oppressing our communities, oppressing our young people, oppressing our uh, these systems and, and putting those resources into our mental health, um, into healing our communities, into healing our leaders, into supporting those, uh, those who are in need um, during uh, challenging times uh, such like this. And so, and I think that, you know, it is also time for, you know, and for me, um, I, I speak when it talks about being a radical social justice leader, like I, I've been doing protesting before all protesting was like the thing to do, right? So like to see how protesting turned, uh, you know, the way it turned with George Floyd, I was one of those people that was on the forefront. Um, if you follow me on social uh, media, I was at every different march um, that was going on in, during that peak of that time. And, and to see that, you know, how many young people that was out there, I mean, it was young people that, you know, was born in the 2000s and young people from 18, 19, 16, 17 years old, older people, white people that was just standing up and saying, listen, it's time for something different. It is time where we are not, we are already been affected by this pandemic and all of us has been on this quarantine and we all been suffering from all these different job losses and these resource losses and all these different challenges and now that we have to go through the the, the challenge of even acknowledging that African Americans that black people are human beings let's first stop and think about that right is that you know for centuries and for years and for decades we haven't even been acknowledged as being human beings right and so now it's time for us to kind of be radical in terms of not only just speaking about it but really making action about it and for all the people that's on here that's the first action is showing up right it's showing up and then once you show up and you receive the resources you receive the knowledge you receive the information you do something about it you make some form of change you make some form of action especially people with power people with power people in the positions uh you know people that have privilege of power using those privilege of power to be able to support those who are less of fortunate and understanding what human rights and, and the equal morals of people should, should be. She got me preaching now. Listen, look, but listen, you know, for me, I'm telling you, I, I'm fired up. I'm fired up. I got young people that's fired up. And, 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 and I'm going to say one thing that we did too, where our organization is on us. Uh, History by uh, leading a youth justice march uh, here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, we uh, 10 years old to 30 years old, and we marched from Columbus City Hall all the way to the Juvenile Justice Center, um, the Ju uh, Franklin County Juvenile Detention Hall, and we, we spoke out of side, outside of there, and then we marched back, and it was raining. We marched in the rain, uh, it was it wasn't raining really hard, but it was light rain. But it was a, a march for young people to speak out on the voice of those young people who are in our justice system right now. Um, those young people who have been affected by the school to prison pipeline. Those young people who have been affected by police brutality. Um, the young people locally. There's been young people from uh, Tyree King to Henry Green. All of our young adults uh, right here in Central Ohio that didn't even make it to the age of 25 years old that were murdered by the hands of our uh, Columbus police. And so. So I, I speak out um, and speak up for, you know, those young people. And I think that, you know, in this time right now, it's time for us to kind of, you know, take owners, take action um, and utilize our power to, to make real change. Right. What a word. Okay. So T, how, how are you, how are you feeling? And I mean, let's catch the energy. Cause I, again, now I'm feeling fired up right now. My spirit. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Exactly. After listening to Terry, I feel differently than I did walking into this um, this this panel. So thank you for that. Um, because I do believe it is hard, right? I think for a lot of us on a day to day, it is heavy. The world is heavy. There is a lot. Um, 
that if you're paying attention is, um, you know, just the level of violence, the level of as much as there's progress and demonstrations of how much we're moving forward, then there's backlash and, 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 um, and it, it can be really heavy from day to day. But I think alongside that, I really agree with Terry. I mean, it is amazing to see this many people, right? It has been said that we are seeing, we are in a moment where more people have been in the streets demonstrating and protesting than any time in the history of the United States. Um, that means that there is change on the horizon. The fact that now people are talking about abolition and divesting and investing and um, what it means to defund the police and that this is on the forefront, this sort of piece of information that maybe police violence is connected to these other issues. It's not just a, a you know, a, 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 a strange aberration um, of our system, but actually it's at the heart of the system and it's part of um, the myriad things of, of, of what is wrong with our criminal legal system. Um, so you just can't come back from that. There's more political education happening on the streets than, you know, for years and years and doing this work, been doing this work for decades. And um, there have been times when those conversations are just very hard to have. And now you have YouTube videos explaining the difference between abolition and reform in 60 seconds and less, you know? Um, and that is just tremendous and provides tons of opportunity. And then I think you referred to COVID. And I think for those of us interested in how we depopulate our prisons and jails, and save dollars um, whether in, and, and invest those resources um, elsewhere. I think that COVID also meant that there were numbers of counties and states which dropped population because of the health concern, the public health crisis. Um, and what it showed is that that can be done. And what it showed is that can be done quickly. And it showed that can be done without a negative impact on public safety. And I think that also opens the door. I think that, um, and the economic crisis means that a lot of us who work in this field can now put pressure on our local governments um, to say, to have them keep those numbers down, close what can be closed, reinvest those dollars, because now more than anything, if, if we ever needed a moment to say public health, we need public health solutions. Um, and, it, and so it is also the time to say, and violence is a public health issue, not a criminal legal system issue. And so many of the things that we shove into our criminal legal system and have police try to address and jail try to address are public health issues. And if there's any place we shouldn't be investing now, it's, it's in there. So I do think that there's hope and I like to listen to the preaching. I need more of it because I can get down on some days, but I do think that a, a lot, a lot has opened up for possibilities and opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so, you know, both of you, you know, we started talking this conversation about defunding and divesting. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we really know that all of this, like you said, Sochi, is an extension. The violence that we're seeing at the hands of law enforcement is really an extension of these um, oppressive systems um, this, for that have, you know, evolved over 400 years. Um, so, you know, how important is it to divest from these systems? And then what are the large scale investments that we do need to overcome? To come the root causes of this racist policy. I can start this time just to break it up, um, shake it up. Um, and I think what I'll do is actually answer just by talking a little bit about the work that we're doing here in Atlanta, because um, it is so critical, right, um, that we as a, as a um, collective and as a society that we start to divest from some of these systems. And what I mean by that is definitely sort of take the dollars, but I actually mean end the institutions, right? Take, there's a way in which our criminal legal system has become the largest domestic um, institution that we have. It ha hires more people. If you put our police together with our correctional officers, if you think of the building and the infrastructure, if you think about the budget, um, that more money, more resources flows into that system than any other, so than our education system, than our healthcare system. Um, and what does that mean? And what does that do? And what does that mean for years and years now of divestment from those other systems. Um, and so for us here in Atlanta, we spent a lot of time early on um, looking at the different policies and laws which landed our people behind bars, um, lots of times for the pettiest of offenses, lots of times simply for being black and poor, or being um, undocumented and poor. These things landed people in a jail that then the city spent $32.5 million every year to run. Um, and our jail holds people only for city ordinance violations and traffic violations. So even if you were accused of a misdemeanor, there's a different jail for you to go to. So this jail literally 
um, served as a, as a homeless shelter, as a um, mental health hospital. And years and years, it ran like that. That was sort of the best solution that the city could come up with. And we spent a lot of time trying to implement diversion programs, um, take out some of the laws that land people there. But in the end, what we saw was this building in downtown Atlanta, a 470,000 square foot behemoth that looms in the, the downtown Atlanta area that just exists almost like as a reminder of the kind of oppression and the kind of history, right? And, um, and it sends a message, I think, to our young people, um, to all people about, you know, where the city's uh, really going to put their money. And we said, that's what we want to that's what we need to target now. That's what we want. We want the dollars that went into running this facility. We want that facility. And so our work over the last year and a half has been to close the jail and then have it repurposed or replaced because we think demolition and replace might be the best option um, with a center for wellness, equity, and freedom. And we've worked very hard to get council members. We got the mayor to sign uh, legislation to create a task force to engage thousands of people in the community to give their vision and input because what we wanted are who's been harmed by that jail, who's been inside that jail. Those are the voices that we need to tell the city what it needs to become, what needs to be there in its place. Um, and so we're in that process now and it's a really dynamic one. I mean, I think it goes to this thing of what do we need to invest in? It's like, we need to talk to communities because it's different from place to place. My guess is it's different in Ohio than it is here in Atlanta. This is different than New York, you know? It's different from neighborhood to neighborhood even. Um, and we started looking at this idea of multiple centers um, because, you know, it, it's not a one size fits all. In fact, it is actually going to communities and not asking the question, like what's wrong with the police here? Or what do you want to see of your police? Or what's wrong with the criminal justice system? It's going to communities and saying, what makes you feel safe? What is it that empowers and keeps this community safe? And then this, and then that's what we invest in. Sometimes it's streetlights and garbage cans, you know, as much as it is um, the bigger things of equity and jobs and education. So I think that the investments, dollar and other kinds of resources um, are as diverse as we are as communities in this country. Um, and that the real work that we have ahead of us is to, um, is to listen closely and deeply and to wrest those resources away from a system right now that is doing tremendous damage and allow them to be allocated by community. Thank you. Terry? Wow, that was powerful. Um, and I, I mean, to me, I will actually want to piggyback off of that for real. Um, because I think in a time, time like this, it is about really the communication and meeting people where they're at. Um, and really in the terms of, you know, if you un, having that communication of asking, you know, people, you know, what is the need, you know, in, in terms of supporting our communities and how can our communities now go back to, you know, police in our own communities, right? Where it was back in the day where everybody knew your name, and everybody knew who you were. Now it's times like where I guess we're virtually connected, right? But everybody knows who everyone is and, and being able to have, you know, that strategic communication um, and that relationship. And then I also want to speak about like really, you know, provide more uh, resources around mental health, um, especially in our low income communities, right? You know, our generation, um, speaking of the millennials and speaking of uh, like the younger generation, is a generation that's really speaking about, you know, that word mental health and speaking about it. You know, my mother's generation and generations before, you know, their, their thing was about, let's just sweep it under the rug, right? No one talks about it. No one, you know, speaks about it. And for us, we say, no, these things are not right. And so, you know, just hearing some of the things that are, some of the young people are dealing with, with just personal in-home um, domestic violence situations that are traumatic to, you know, the growth and the development of some young people. And thinking about how disruptive the education system is right now in terms of the virtual. And a lot of people are dealing with a lot of stress, right? You know, a lot, I was talking to my sister the other day and she was just telling me, she says, she said, brother, I'm working two jobs and I'm going, you know, I'm working online to do school. 
Plus I gotta, you know, feed, cook, clean. And then I don't even know how to even work that virtual thing that they got on the school, right? I don't even know, you know, half of the elements that comes with it. I don't even have the time to even learn all of that, right? And so how are we, you know, thinking about ways to support those young people that even already had challenges before when it came to school? And I know, cause I was a mentor. I was, you know, dealing with the VCAP program and mentoring students that were on VCAP and, and VCAP is basically a, a, a program that young people, if they're, you know, uh, fell in a school, they can be able to make up some classes and virtually. And so, you know, some of those students needed other support outside of just the support from the VCAP, but just somebody to talk to, right? Young people are going through things and people are going through so much in the community and they don't even have that conversation. And sometimes people just act off of PTSD, right? That post-traumatic um, uh, stress disorder where you just, you know, something you know, and they ask like well, what's the spike in in the killings and in, in the spike in killings and teen violence is that you know young people don't even have pro-social uh, activities that they can do that are you know positive that the parks and recs are all shut down and all of the different community spaces that are positive and provide those different resources are now tuning into trying to get people virtual well you can't get these young people virtual because they ain't got a laptop at home or they don't even got good wi-fi or they don't even got those good services and so when we think about as we move forward uh, in, in terms of the investment, there's a lot that has to be invested in terms of, you know, um, just the, the, the pro-social uh, and mental health when it comes to just people's thinking and awareness. Because that, that is just, I think, especially in our community in terms of healing, uh, and it goes both ways, right? Because there's some people that, you know, are, you know, been the oppressors has been traumatized too, right? And they need some form of healing and some form of uh, discussions and tra traumatic experiences that they experience in their lives that cause them to make act out these, you know, violent, vicious acts on black people and young black lives, you know, and, and for them to, to be going through what they're going through, they need some form of healing too. So I think it, it, we should create a space um, that's called a social justice healing space, right? Where we could come together Together, we could have a, a space of just, you know, especially those, there's a lot of people that's on here, a lot of educators, a lot of organizers, a lot of leaders, you know, for all of those who are on here, it, it's, it's time for us to carve out that space to, you know, you know, release the stress that we have on ourselves. And I think that that's what's going to be best for us moving forward, especially after we're overcoming the, the, these, these challenges, uh, circumstances like this, where we're dealing with the pandemic and things are shutting down even more as, as we see and we don't know what it's about to look like in this winter time no one knows what's about to, about to happen in the winter time and no one knows what's about to happen in this election coming up in 2020 either but that's a whole other story and so listen um, <laughs> yes oh oh you turned yourself up okay well i mean you both of you said a lot of different things and um you know, from your 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 story, Terry, to Sochi, the work that you are doing in Atlanta, I heard you know many different roadblocks that are put in place by policies that are put in place by individual behavior. But we know it rests on anti-blackness. It rests on you know systemic oppression and systemic racism. But at the same time, there were things that supported you in your individual story. And there are investments and things that have happened because we're in a global pandemic that all of a sudden we can decarcerate, we can depopulate all of a sudden. So, you know, as we hold these uh, policies from education and post-secondary education in jails and, and prison to um, expungement policy, not having fees to um, decriminalization of things like poverty and, 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 and homelessness. Um, what are some of the things that you all are seeing in your work as you go from this power and movement building to systems and policy change? So I heard a lot of them in your stories and what you said, but what are some other these specific things? We have a lot of different folks um, joining us today from, like you said, from education to workforce development to folks who are in the, the trenches and, and, and doing the justice work. But what are some specific um, systems or policy changes that you all have seen or have been a part of in shifting? 
Sochi, you wanna get started on that? Sure, sure. Um, it's a really good question. I think that it is so important that everybody in the fields that they are in um, are thinking right now about what um, kind of resources would mean to your sector. You know, I think that we've like operated a lot of us um, just with a lot of scarcity over the last few decades. And, and now is the moment to say, if, if me and my education system, my role as a teacher, my role as in workforce development, what is it that we would actually need to do the work that we know needs to happen? Um, that that's what we're talking about. You know, it's not like we don't know. And I think like Terry referred to, you know, our mental health system is, needs an incredible infusement of, of resources. Um, we have very few community-based mental health uh, centers at all. We have very few, and, and, and so in almost any of those systems you can imagine, um, really infusing it with the dollars and also the incredible, like the people, the human, the human resources that have been put towards our criminal legal system. Um, and now is the time for us to think about um, it's a time for us to think about with COVID, like entrepreneurial, uh, which has always been a thing for formerly incarcerated people in particular, because when you're blocked from jobs, a lot of what you have to do is create your own. And so, um, you know, we still have to wrangle with like the licensure boards in every state and certification processes, which are, you know, have racial bias in them and have bias against formerly incarcerated people. So it's like finding those places of barriers um, but, you know, investing in those kinds of, because the, I think the job market that we've known up till now is about, is, is going, is changing, has changed, and is going to change more. And so how do people, um, you know, make enough to, to stay alive? And um, like Ter to Terry's example around like people having multiple jobs and now school being online. I think new things like school collectives are going to start, right? We're seeing it already, like people doing kind of homeschooling where there's um, more community base in that. Um, I think food systems, I think right now there's this moment to say with, with potential when sort of COVID was on the horizon and, and this idea of perhaps supply chain um, disruption and people going, do we know how to grow our own food? Do we know how to feed ourselves, you know? And for lots of us, we had family, our parents or grandparents or great grandparents totally know Right, but it's been not handed down over the years for lots of reasons. And I think there's a reclaiming in a lot of our communities and how do we invest and get our state and city to invest in supporting people in growing their own food and learning how to um, do sustainable agriculture. Um, so I think those are some of the things I know a lot less, I come from a background, a lot less around education, though I know other people could pick that up and there's certainly things there, but I think almost all of the systems which really support um, us and our human development um, could use could use those kinds of investments. Mm -hmm. Terry, what about what about you? Um, some of the things you've been seeing translated um, into systems and policy change. Um, so for me, can you hear me? Yep. For me, um, as soon as this uh, kind of social justice uh, movement happened with George Floyd, uh, a few people kind of reached out to me. Uh, one was a, a college, uh, Ohio State University. I ended up doing a training for um, some students um, at a, a predominantly white school, high school, around how can they do some digital organizing, um, teaching them ways that how can they utilize their power uh, in times like this to support not only their peers, but also support um, other young people within their community. Um, then another school reached out to me. Uh, I actually was a, a speaker for Ohio State and the guy became an administrator for a local high school um, and the school is called um, KIPP. So I don't know if you guys ever know of KIPP, but KIPP is a, a school that's all around the country. It is uh, actually owned by billionaires and it supports a, a lot. And this school actually had, I think 95% is African-American students um, that's inside of the school. And, you know, the, I actually talked to the, the principal of the middle school and the administration and what their focus is, they want to work with me 
on creating new policies to actually develop anti-racial, uh, anti-racist school. So what does it look like to actually have an anti-racist school and how can they be strategic around holding, um, you know, their administration accountable, but also adding social justice to their curriculum as a forefront of their curriculum. And so I actually met with their diversity and inclusion team and we're in the process of really, you know, strategizing what that looks like. Uh, of course, there's a lot of different new things that's coming along. Uh, and then the last one I will speak about, so I'm, I'm all about when it thinks about youth and education, um, is ending the school to prison pipeline. Uh, I'm always going to speak and raise awareness on that. Uh, last year, we had an opportunity to host a forum where we had a local juvenile judge, we had a high school uh, teacher, we had some attorneys, we had some community activists, uh, we had a panel, a very powerful panel. Uh, of people and, and also young people that was connected to uh, those resources around how do uh, we end the school to prison pipeline or how do we be strategic around or, or are we one, you know, reducing the funding to uh, uh, not support uh, police officers in school or do we provide training for police officers in school or do we give police officers in school another job outside of just sitting around in the hallways? Why don't you go teach a class, right? Or why don't you go, you know, you know, mentor a group of young people or why don't you, you know, um, work with some young people that may potentially want to be a police officer and maybe have some form of class or training or something of that nature. So thinking of different ways of how do we maybe build that community and police relationship and not young people being penalized and punished and seeing them as, you know, a system that's going into the prison system from the education system. And so those are, you know, being the policies that, you know, I've been working on and new policies that I'm trying to work on in terms of, of, of really being radical around this uh, new way of this educational system. Uh, excellent. I was going to so, throw in one thought, ahead, if I can, ahead, just, a, just a quick one, just because I realized it was on my mind. Um, and I don't know if it, you know, is, is helpful to some of the people who are on here, but I also think this is a really critical moment. The, what your question pointed to for me was that right now there's a lot of, um, you know, we live in like hashtag world where there's a lot of like hashtags and a lot of like defund the police and you've got council members, you know, you've got police chiefs protesting with, you know, the city folks who are and saying, yeah, we need to put an end to this and we need to stop. But really being careful to not assume that that then equates or turns into automatically real policy shift. Um, I think that like I have a deep respect for these institutions that existed for so long and they crank themselves, they have their own self-interest, you know, and um, all these things. Atlanta is a great example because there was so much energy and so much community um, conviction and demand for change and when that you know came to city council and came to the mayor's office wow the wheels of change just slowed all the way down and unless you are sharp and and persistent and you're going to stay on it and you're going to recognize that it means you've got to change legislation over here and change policy of institution over there and you're going to have to confront this challenge it really doesn't just happen because we it like needs the streets and it needs the the community demand, and then it needs us to keep persisting to actually enact meaningful policy change. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. That was perfect, because um, before we kick off the questions, we have several. I, one of the questions I have to ask, because as you know, CLASP is a um, national policy and advocacy organization. We work with many folks across the country and community and states. And you all talked a lot about what happens locally. And we know at the rubber meets the road with lots of this work, it's institutions, it's changing school policies, it's changing, you know, working with mayors and city council and prosecutors and, and so forth, um, and the state policy. But do you all see a role, a federal role in all this work? And if you can just briefly share, because we have a lot of questions we want to get to, briefly share some ideas um, that you think will be supportive for a federal role, a national role, as we continue this fight? Um, I don't know who wants to jump in. <laughs> I can go really quick, because I'll just point to one. I do think there is a federal role, but I think that just to call attention for people to the BREATHE Act, um, which has been introduced um, and which has a lot of provisions really points to how much 
federal dollars are what get tied to how local policing happens, right? What equipment is available, where police are trained. A lot of that um, comes down, even though it's decided locally, dollars are attached to an incentive, provide incentives. And I think the Breeze Act, it just is for people to look at it and recognize it's a brilliant um, piece of legislation that the Movement for Black Lives and others have supported and put forth. And I think it's a great place for us to start um, putting our attention and energy. Excellent, excellent. Terry, anything you wanna to say to that before we jump into the questions from folks who are joining us today? Well, yeah, I wanna, when you think about federal, I wanna also speak about the dollars, right? Uh, and speaking about uh, them being intentional about, you know, investing in some of those dollars inside of, you know, supporting the growth and development of these young people and, and providing those, the access to the resources that young people need. Um, some young people, you know, just right here in central Ohio is an economic despair. We have multimillionaires that are, you know, two streets away from, you know, the most impoverished streets. And so how are we really creating that equal and equitable uh, access uh, to resources? Excellent, excellent. All right, we have some questions. Do you wanna kick us off? Yeah, thank you. And um, thanks everybody for sending your questions. This is really great. Um, this, I think one of this, this is the question for Terry um, and kind of talking about some of the systems change. Um, someone asks, I'm curious if Terry thinks the language included in his motion could be the basis for some policy change for criteria for expungement. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I definitely think, I, I agree. Uh, I believe that the whole process um, and, and even, you know, some of the stuff that was said inside of my motion, and I can definitely share my motion is, is something that's public record. Um, but, you know, being able to share uh, and being able to utilize that to one, make a, a change in terms of what the process looks like uh, for those who have to go through. Because I know a, a few people that's done reached out to me um, and just asking me, you know, what, what did I do? How did you go about it? Uh, and just giving maybe a, a how-to step. Um, some people said I should start running workshops. Uh, so I got a whole lot of different things that I could be doing. Uh, I'm actually in the process of writing a book. Uh, and so my book will be released pretty soon and I have a lot of details inside of there, but I think that it, you to agree upon that, yes, that motion can be able to help shift and create new policies uh, around record expungement. Thanks, Harry. Um, here's a, another question too. I, uh, what's, I guess, you know, this one is how can we promote some of this with the networks, friends and family? What's the specific message um, that we, you want to be sharing? Is that for me? Either one, yeah. So, Jay Terry. <laughs> Say the question again. I'm sorry. Um, how can we promote this work with our networks, friends, and family? Um, is there a specific message that you would like people to share? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, you can uh, share our website. Uh, I, I believe she shared my website link. Um, I'm actually hosting a virtual social justice awards uh, on Sunday, uh, September 20th. So uh, you can visit socialjusticeawards.org. Uh, or just connect with us uh, through LinkedIn. And that's how you can connect with me. I don't know about... Uh... <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, yes, definitely. Um, in terms of this message, I mean, I would love people to support the work in Atlanta. And um, so both websites, we have rjactioncenter.org and then also closethejailatl.org. Um, you can sign up for updates. You can, oh, there's always action to take. There's, you know, call the mayor, call the council members. Um, and um, right now we have a survey. We had an incredible architect and design team called Designing Justice Designing Spaces come and look at the jail and give four recommendations for what it could be turned into. Two of them are about repurposing and renovating it and two of it demolish it and, and replace it. And um, they're beautiful and we have a survey. We would love for you to take the survey and um, vote on which you, know, you think, um, and of course it's more for local folks than national folks, but still your input is valuable. Um, and then I think in a more broad way, you know, to take the message for me, I have, I have this thing, people have for so long, all, we've been forced into kind of the silos of working in, our, in the criminal legal system. So you have formerly incarcerated people working on issues of expungement or ban the box, and then people who are working on police violence and police brutality. And I think now is this moment to make the connections and wherever you work, 
Um, I always say this to every elected official I talk to, something when a bill comes across your desk and it calls for harsher penalties, consider rejecting it. Just consider it. That's like the fastest response. Everybody, it's the go-to right now. If there's a problem, make it illegal. And that needs to stop. And we need people on all levels to stop and to recognize that when you maybe benefit from the um, quote unquote inmate labor that the jail does in your neighborhood when they come through and pick up trash, just think about what that is and what that supports. And, um, and at all turns in all places of our life, just challenge that the humanizing of people involved in the criminal justice system that that go to I was just on a Facebook exchange with somebody you know who I could tell just so clearly wanted to be like there are bad people and those bad people get locked up and I don't know what you know and it's just like were would it were it so simple that would be you know that but it but we know it's not we know the system has been designed to target many of us and um that there are so many needs in our communities and so just to like reject that, the reject the the base dismissal of um, people because they are involved in criminal, the distrust, the automatic suspicion, all of that, really recognize how much racism, sexism, homophobia, um, and you know, and and capitalism and classism play uh, in that system, and and who it who it delegitimizes. Um, and I think in any place that you are, try to raise that up, try to bring um, people into the fold who can bring other perspectives and talk the real deal about what those systems are like and what they do to us um, and ensure that we are at every stage in every place. So don't think it's not your, your job to oppose the new law that's gonna put people in jail for 10 years for, ex, you know, for violating their probation. Like all of those issues are, should be all of our issues. Yeah. Um, another question here, um, it's, I, it's kind of, when Sochi, we had our prep call, you said, you mentioned how frustrated you had been and how we need to respect some of our opponents more. And so this question kind of gets to that a little bit and, it, you know, it feels like nothing has been working so far. Where can we begin to invest in healing of our communities? Will you repeat just the last the last part of that question? I got the part where I'm respecting the formidable opposition <laughs> that we have. But what's the second part? Where can we begin to start investing in the healing of our communities when nothing we do seems to be working so far? Hmm. I feel like Terry, that's a question for you because you inspire me when you speak on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, you want mute Terry. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry. I was trying to, I was like, hold on, say, say the question again. I'm sorry, say it again. Where, where do we begin to invest in the healing of our communities when nothing we do seems to be working so far? Um, to me, I think really, I mean, the first is education, right? Is because the lack of, of people not knowing how important it is um, for mental health or what mental health or what that actually is in terms of stress and in terms of healing. Um, some people just need to be educated on, on it first. Um, and, and then two, really providing, you know, those resources into, you know, those counselors. Um, and, and when I'm thinking about the education system, you know, they say there's certain schools only have one or two um, counselors in a university or one or two counselors um, this inside of a school or school district, I should say. And so how are we being strategic around investing dollars inside of, you know, you know, counseling support, um, maybe even having, you know, pop up shops uh, with counselors or having counselors on the corners or something like that, right? It's time to be innovative, right? It's time to, you know, now people are having church at the park, right? What's, what is it like to have, you know, sessions where we can have group sessions? And I, I say some of the things is let's, you know, start with your own, you know, your, your own local community, your own local family and finding, you know, strategic small resources and ways that y'all can kind of, you know, start healing with each other. Um, but I think the first thing is for us is like, is how do we educate our community on understanding like it is important for, you know, self-awareness, it's important for self-healing and self-encouragement and self-empowerment, right? And some people, you know, don't live in to understand that, right? And they, you deal with a lot of stress 
Um, and I think that that becomes the first when it comes to to the healing process. I hope I answered that. Yeah. 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 And it, and it made me have a thought too, just to, to throw in, which is I, the question was framed as kind of like when, when nothing that we're doing is working. And I guess maybe I would just say, I'm not so sure nothing we're doing is working. I think there's a lot that we're doing in communities that are working. And I think in some ways it's the oppressive system that tries to strip us of that or mm -hmm. act as if, you know, we don't have any resources inside of ourselves and inside of our communities that we always have to look externally for to someone to help us or someone in it. And then I think that actually there's examples all over this country of, of, small, of small like transformative and restorative justice projects, right? That are actually working to heal when harm is done between two people um, or a group of people. How do we do, how do we hold folks accountable but have a healing process that is outside of the current one that we know doesn't really work for anybody, the accused or survivors. Um, and I think there's all kinds of experiments around interrupting violence um, of young people. And there's um, brilliance in our neighborhoods and there's neighborhood gardens all over there. So I think there's a lot that is going really well and that we do really well. And it's under-resourced, it's under-promoted, it's undervalued for sure. But I think maybe it's our job to, to hold those up and to rem you know, remember and remind ourselves like that we have, um, we have a lot of resources in our communities that we can tap. Yeah, I really, yeah. Thanks, Soji. Um, I guess just last question, unless anyone wants to say anything else, but uh, I think, you know, maybe for you, Terry, um, what kind of suggestions do you have to get some, to get buy-in from youth? Um, and, and I guess for you too, Soji, to get, how do you get youth, young people to really buy into this process and, um, and participate in some of these action steps? Um, well, some of the young people are ready. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the young people that I'm working with are kind of, you know, this is a, this is a, a time for them to kind of step up and, and, you know, make action. And, you know, another thing is incentivizing some of our young people. So a lot of young people, you know, um, you know don't have too many different resources. Um, in terms of resources at home or in terms of some of their parents may have lost their job. And so, like I said, we, we received a grant through our local parks and recs for about $20,000, but it gives us an opportunity to actually uh, give some stipends out to some of our young people uh, through a five week program um, that we just uh, pilot and our graduation is next week. Yeah, all of the young people is graduating. So I'm excited about that. But, you know, being able to be intentional about providing young people with different resources, even if it's something as such as a gift card or something, you know, such as uh, uh, a different resource that they can need to support them um, is, is, is what I've been doing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. We want to close with one question. And then for those of you who are still on, on and um, with us, you know, be starting to populate, you know, um, it's a question I always like to ask, like, what, what is justice to you? Give us a couple of words in the chat to kind of keep us going. But Sochi and Terry, um, what are your next steps? And you can speak from your organization or personally, what are your next steps? What are your next steps? in reimagining justice? Great question. Um, and, and I'm gonna try to slide in. I had a thought um, when Terry was speaking um, to that last question too, so I'll just I'll sneak it in, um, which is just to say, I see my, my old partner in justice from Louisiana is on here, Gina Womack, who runs the Families hey, of Friends. Hey, Gina, I saw her too. <laughs> children. Hey, Gina. And, um, and, you know, we used to say at Flick all the time that like, organize that what we do as organizers is actually remove the barriers for people to organize themselves. So it's a little bit less this feeling of, you know, I've got to figure out how to engage people and cajole people to participate in my thing and more. Folks are, there are fo natural organizers, there are folks who want to fight for a better world for themselves, for their children, but there are lots of barriers. And how do you help remove those? And like one of the ones that was just being mentioned, certainly financially, that's a huge one. Um, certainly knowledge about some of our institutions and how to impact them is another one. Um, you know, there's just different. So I just think that that's a really, um, I always hold that up in terms of thinking of how to get young people involved or whatever, is what are the barriers? Because especially right now, you can't, you can't say young people aren't involved right now and look in the streets and see who's there. Um, but I think what's next for me um, is actually, you know, there's a lot of work still to happen here in Atlanta. 
um, we will complete the closure of the jail and we will see it repurposed or replaced into a center for wellness, equity and freedom. Um, and it will be a model for the country. Um, and that all makes me very excited. And, and I think then also there's just gonna be for us some writing and reflecting about what we've learned um, through this period about the kind of work, the challenges, you know, what you referred to earlier is really about, you know, we've learned some things about how, how our opponents um, are the power that backs them, um, what entrenched uh, institutions, what that really means when something has been built for 400 years for a particular purpose. And that, you know, people can just say, oh yeah, we'll, tra we'll reform it, we'll transform it. Well, hmm, you know, what is, how intractable is it? And it, where do you have to kind of uproot it in order to get to it and not try to just like slap on coats of paint um, so I think that we want to do some reflection and writing um, so that so much of this energy that's bubbling around the country hopefully could learn from some of the, you know, the good things we did and the mistakes that we made um, and take that to the next, take that to the next level in your local jurisdiction. Yeah, thanks, Sochi. Terry, how about you? What do you what, what's next for you in reimagining justice, personally or professionally? Um, what's up? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm gonna I'm a do it. I'm gonna do it. Two or one. Um, well, uh, professionally, um, reimagining um, justice is definitely, um, you know, reimagine the way we support our young people um, during these challenging times. And, and one of the things that we're doing with our organization is we're in the process of developing a virtual mentoring program that we're looking to, to launch in, in the fall. Uh, gives the young people the opportunity to, to connect with people, um, connect with mentors, um, and be able to accept and, and, and do different goals that they can accept and, and having different challenges, but also engage. Um, two, we're looking to, um, one, provide or uh, launch a school assistance program. Um, so for those students that um, parents that are needing in terms of support for, for their students. Um, like I said, my sister working two jobs. She's, you know, and going to school. Sometimes some parents need, you know, a place where they can drop their student off for a half a day. We can help them with mentoring um, in, in terms of supporting and tutoring their virtual programs, their virtual online schooling, um, and also engaging with some of our programs. Um, and then the other thing is um, we're going to launch a youth men, uh, a youth food truck. So I got a food truck uh, sponsor that I've been working with, and he's got a few trucks, and we're looking um, to kind of be able to provide more um, employment opportunities through food truck and food service um, and culinary experience for young people. Um, and so that's the work side. And then for Reimagine Justice on the personal side is really um, more healing for myself. Um, you know, I know for my story, you know, of experiences so much trauma, um, so many challenging circumstances from being a homeless and being affected by the justice system. And, you know, there's so many people in my family are still dealing with uh, challenging circumstances right now. And even for me, myself, you know, after, you know, 15, 16 years later, after all the things that I've experienced, and here I am today, I'm still, you know, mm -hmm trying to strive for more healing for myself. And so um, more investment inside of, you know, getting counseling, um, more investment to, to my self-care, which is music. Um, I love music. I love going to the studio, making music, listening to music. And so I think for me is like, how can I reimagine justice? How can I, um, you know, pour from an empty cup? I gotta be able to fill my cup up so it's an overflow so that when I can be out there and doing this work, I can be able to do it full throttle and do it as to my best ability so I can be able to help change and save uh, lives. Yes, yes. Well, I'm gonna throw this to my um, co-moderator and partner in that our justice work, um, intersectional justice work across class. What's next for you, Dewey, in oh. reimagining justice? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I think I've obviously, you know, this conversation has been really important and so critical at this time. Um, like I said before, you know, we are are doing ourselves really trying to evaluate our role in in this radical transformative moment or movement really. Um, and we're gonna continue hold, holding these conversations, centering the voices of people who have been impacted, the people, the organizers who are doing the work like we've gotten to talk to today. 
Um, next week, we're going to have a part two sort of with this conversation. So please do um, join us there. Um, you know, about a year ago, we brought together about 60 people from across the country to really develop this vision for reimagining justice. And, you know, some of those ideas that came out of, you know, making people who have record a protected class. So there's no, dis you know, there's no discrimination there to reinvest marijuana revenues in the uh, communities that are most impacted by the war on drugs. Um, you know, we uh, a national subsidized jobs program directed at people who have um, criminal rec uh, criminal records or have been impacted by the justice system. And, and, you know, those are some big ideas that we drew out of the meeting. But I think even now we're they're more important than ever to really get done. And so that's what we'll be fighting for. Uh, you know, Sochi mentioned the Breathe Act. We've been working really closely with um, the Movement for Black Lives folks on on making sure there are really strong investment provisions in that um, that can really dismantle these oppressive structures. So we're also really looking forward to that and um, just really building on this, building on this conversation, building these partnerships. So I'm excited. And I'm gonna turn it to you, Keisha, because I feel like <laughs> you're gonna do that. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna wrap up a little bit early um, uh, to give you a little bit of time back. We're saving the chat because we always like to see what people think, what does justice look like to you? And, um, you know, as a national policy organization, that is white led. We are working on this change from the inside out. So we're committed to teasing out what, all the things we heard and how can we as, as a national policy organization be an allyship to the movement, not to Johnny come lately. And we've been working on this, but we really have to kind of talk the talk and walk the walk when we do this. But I think, so that's my, our commitment to class and, and all of you who've joined us, we really, really appreciate you joining us and hope that you can walk on this journey with us and for us not to diminish the demands from the streets. Like, you know, Dave Chappelle said, the streets are speaking for themselves. So it's not about us diminishing, it's up to amplify and to use our policy expertise to figure out the ways in which the kinds of things Terry and Sochi described today can happen. So that's what we're committed to. On a personal note, I need to be committed to my mental health because, you know, a lot of these things are triggering. And I, you know, I, I you know, said to a friend and I might even put it on Twitter, you know, I grew up in 1990s Philadelphia and I have not experienced this kind of anxiety since I was a teenager. And Terry, you were talking about the generation. So you know, I'm a Gen X or so. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so, you know, when we're also in this movement, and this is what I'm just going to share to everyone as we close out, because we're all doing some level of social justice work, of some human support work. And so we have to fortify ourselves so that we can continue on the journey. So whatever that means to you, I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to find the light and to look for the inspiration. I know certainly this conversation, all of you on the Zoom today, um, Terry and Sochi and, and Dewey really have enriched me. Shout out to the rest of our team, Kayla and Whitney, who's also been a part of us organizing this and us really thinking about what does healing centered liberation policy look like in today's context. So enjoy the rest of your afternoon and take care of yourselves and be well. Thanks, everybody. All right. Closing this out now. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, y'all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>